The level of funding needs to increase and put to better use to control and combat the spreading of invasive plants. Prof. Brian van Wilgen from Stellenbosch University shed some light on this matter. Alle beste het groot planne vir die koffiebedrijf en Plaas TV het onlangs saam met hulle oor een koppie koffie gekeier. Bly ingeskakel vir een inzetsel hier oor, ons skakel nou eers oor na Lise toe vir die jongste landbouwnies. Communique exists to serve feed and food producers. In the news today, SA Cane Growers recently made a submission to the National Treasury calling on Minister Enoch Kodongwana to suspend the increase in the sugar tax and to eliminate the tax entirely. This is in light of the crisis in which the South African sugar industry currently finds itself. The submission was made pursuant to a call for comments on the 2023 budget review issued by the National Treasury. SA Cane Growers made a similar submission to the National Council of Provinces Select Committee on Finance in response to a call for comments. These calls for comments came shortly after the board at Tongat Hewlett decided to put the company's South African operations into business rescue. The South African Hunters and Game Conservation Association recently requested the Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, Barbara Creasy, to remove the term animal well-being from its revised draft biodiversity white paper. The association says its definition refers to physical, psychological and mental health similar to the definition of well-being of humans. It can be interpreted as putting animals and people at the same level, with similar rights. The organization also says that from a legal perspective, using the term well-being in relation to animals can lead to contentious debates. And the country's best wine writer for 2022 is Chandra van Amarva, Tasting room manager at De Vet Cellar outside Worcester. The runner-up is Pietri de Beer, who was the senior winemaker at Long Ridge Winery until recently. The result of this competition, now in its 10th year, were announced at a function at the Lanzarote Hotel in Stellenbosch. The winner and runner-up won 15,000 rand and 7,500 rand respectively. The SA Wine Writer of the Year is open for writers 35 years old old or younger, and is represented by the South African National Wine Show Association. The aim is to identify smart new voices in the wine industry. That's today's news. Although millions of rand has been spent annually since 1998 to eradicate invasive plants and although progress has been made in places, we still have not won the battle. Various estimates suggest that we need three to seven times more money to reduce invasive plants everywhere to manageable levels. Despite a lack of proper funding, working for water is still considered a very successful program. Joining me now, Professor Brian van Wilgen from the Centre for Invasive Biology at Stellenbosch University. Brian, first of all, who is Working for Water? Working for Water is a, a government job creation program. Uh, it's one of the environmental uh, programs that they, they are running and it's uh, this one is aimed at clearing invasive alien plants from areas where they are invading. So they use uh, unemployed people, mainly from rural areas, and they give them an opportunity to work. And at the same time, they can help landowners to deal with the problem of invasives. So that includes both private landowners and state landowners. 
Before we talk about the funds that have been allocated to control or counter the spread of invasive plants, how do you actually do this? Who's involved and what methods are used? To, to, to mention a few. Well, there's basically three methods that you can use. The one is mechanical. So you that's just cutting the trees down or pulling them out by the roots. Then there's chemical methods, which is using herbicides. Uh, and the third method is to use biological control. So biological control is simply bringing in pests and insects on that particular plant. So you've got to be careful that you don't uh, bring in something that's going to attack other things. So there's a whole protocol around biological control, but it's been very successful uh, in the past in dealing with some of the invasive species. Where do you operate? Do you have projects everywhere? Well, Working for Water operates across the entire country. So we've got provinces, uh, uh, projects in all of nine provinces. Uh, so it's not restricted to a particular area. It's more determined by where the invasive plants are. Now, since 1998, you have spent 310 million per year, but it seems that you are fighting a losing battle. A study was done by you and two other people, Andrew Vannenberg from the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, as well as John Wilson from the National Biodiversity Institute, to determine what you actually need. Talk to us about the study. Well, uh, the 300 million rand per year, we are very grateful for. Let's say that up front, because many, many other countries are not spending any money on this problem. But the trouble is, with that amount of money, we've only been able to reach about 14% of the estimated invaded area. So for the other 86%, as far as we can see, there's not much management going on. So when you look at the effectiveness of the program, in the areas where it does work, it's made good progress in clearing those areas of invasive alien plants. But uh, when you look at it at a national scale, across the whole country, the plants are still spreading because they're spreading faster than we can clear them. So what is the conclusion of your appeal? Well, we've looked at the, at the problem over 20 years, or the management of the problem rather over 20 years. And we are making recommendations uh, to the government uh, the first is that if you have only a limited amount of money, you should spend it on priority areas, areas where you can actually address the problem, areas that are important, perhaps as water catchments or rangelands where you're producing livestock and so on, or biodiversity hotspots. If you focus on those areas, you can be a lot more effective than running a whole lot of projects all over the place. So that's the first thing. It's called conservation triage. You decide which ones you're going to save, and then you save them. The, the second thing that we would encourage a lot more of is biological control. You know, none of these uh, plants are a problem in the areas where they come from because they're held in check there by a whole lot of insects and pathogens. And if we can bring some of them over here and make sure they don't attack anything else, then we can have a lot of uh, impact on the problem. It's, it's sustainable as well. They don't go away. I mean, they work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. <laughs> they don't go and strike. So it's a wonderful solution if you can get it. And then the, the third thing is to try to raise more money. Uh, I don't think we should expect that the government should do everything. Uh, so the private sector has to get involved. Uh, we can get maybe corporate sponsorship. And we can look for foreign aid. There's a lot of programs globally now that fund conservation projects, and we should go and try and tap those. If someone wants to get involved, whether it's agriculture or the private sector, what can we do? Well, there are, there are people in this program all over the place. You know, in the Department of Environment Affairs, uh, you will find people there. There's a, a, a Center for Invasion Biology at Stellenbosch University who you could contact and there's also a Center for Biological Control at Rhodes University. So these would be good entry points if you wanted to. And then, you know, where I live here in the Western Cape, we have a lot of hack groups. There are local groups that go out and volunteer to, to clear alien plants once or twice a week. And they're doing a good job locally. So that's another thing you could do if you want to help. I'd like to get back to the employment possibilities of these projects. Well, uh, clearing invasive alien plants is a labor-intensive uh, undertaking. It, it's hard work. So uh, that's the one point. 
But then we have, we do not have a shortage of unemployed people, that is for sure. We know what the unemployment figures look like in this country. So the, it, it's both a way of helping those people find some employment, and it's also a way of dealing with the problem. So it's a kind of win-win solution. It just needs to be focused a bit more on some of the priority areas. Why is it so important to get rid of these plants? Well, because they have a big impact. Uh, one of the big impacts that they have is a lot of invasive trees that uh, use a lot of water. So we get less water out of our mountain catchments and our streams dry up and the dams don't fill up and so on. So that's, that's one of the reasons. If you look at rangelands where people are running livestock on uh, natural felt, there's a lot of plants that invade the natural felt and that they reduce the ability of that felt to support livestock. So maybe if you had a farm that could support 2,000 sheep, you now have a farm that can only support 500 sheep if it becomes invaded. There's biodiversity losses. Of course, we have many, many rare and endangered species, which uh, are, are just shaded out by these invasive plants. Uh, there are other reasons, like they exacerbate fires, and some of them are toxic, uh, and so on. So there are a lot, of, a lot of impacts that they have. Well, that was Professor Brian Wilhelm from the Center for Invasive Biology at Stellenbosch University. Syngenta, bringing plant potential to life. Goeiedag, het was redelijk een rooi week op die termijnmarkt voor de levering van grane en oliesade in maart. Wit met die prijs het week op week met 4,7% gedaald, terwijl geel met is 3,8% goedkoper geworden het. Koringprijs 1,7% laar, terwijl die sonneboomprijs ook met 2,5% gedaald het. Soeboomprijs het echter onveranderd gebleven week op week en is interessant hoe nabij dit nou aan die prijs van sonneblomme is. Olieprijs skerp verswak die afgelopen week met 12,4% en een vijfje brand kost net oor die 76 dollar. Dan het die rand evens verswak ten oor die vernaamste wisselkoorse 0,2% zwakker ten oor die dollar, 0,1% zwakker ten oor die pond en 0,3% zwakker ten oor die euro. Als jij liefde voor koffie eet, je blij in die Magubas kloof area. Jij is een boer. Wat doe jij dan? Jij plant koffie om aan die behoefte te voldoen. Dit is hoe hier die koffieaanplanting in boerderij begint. Ons het die voorraad gehad om hier te komen keier en koffie te komen proe. Drie types koffie. Kom samen met mij, dan hoor ons hoe voor het gedoen en wat behels die plant van koffie. Wat voor ons begin het, was um, wel, ons is koffieliefhebbers. Um, so ons het begin met koffie, eindelijk met die idee van kom ons plant bykie vir die kantoor, die type van ding. En wat gebeur het is, ons is bezig met ewe ontwikkelings. Maar dan baie keer het jy uitvalstukke, hier is nou nie een baie goeie voorbeeld van dit nie, maar jy sal een deel soos hierdie bijvoorbeeld ewe is plant, en dan sal uitvalstukkie wat net te skyns is om ewe is te plant. So dan sal ons gaan en ons soek iets om daar te plant. Jy wil nie, het net onkruid word wat jy bestuur nie. Um, en om jou en een van die ekonomische waarde uit dit te kan put. So, ons koffiepad is hier al begin door om onbenutte ewe grond um, te begin gebruik met een gewas. Nou, Janine is redelijk beperk. So, um, in daai opzicht, iets wat ek nie vir ewe is benut nie, kan ek nie vir makke daarmee is benut nie. So, dis waar ons eindelijk koffie toe gaan het. Nou, Toen we met die koffiepad begin het, het ons besef, dat is nie eindelijk koffiemateriaal net vrijelijk beskikbaar nie. So, my stap hier net by een kwekerij in en koop 4000 of 10.000 bome nie. 
Um, so ons heel eerste besending boompies het ons gekry, het ons al uit Sabi Vallei uitgekry, ons het 800 plankies gekry, alles in cultivar. Um, en dit geplant, maar waar ons nie geweet het, gaan ons die koffie dan recht kry, ons nie eers geweet hoe om het te verwerk nie. Um, so, ons was happy met die getal, maar nou vaar het jy twee jaar om oes te kry, en toe ons die eerste oes afhaal, toe proe die koffie so slecht as jy nie kan denk nie. Um, en dis waar een vriend my toe aan Matt bekend gestel het, um, nou, met sy geschiedenis is baie langer as wat ek het nou gaan sê, maar hy, wat ek om ontmoet het, is hy het vir Tribeca um, gewerk, nou baie van julle wat in die stad is behoord, idiot he, wat Tribeca is, maar onder andere ran hulle die Woolworths cafes en hulle supply Woolworths met hulle koffie, that's the simplified as much as I can. Um, so, toet ons vir met, ek het om ontmoet in die stad en vir hom so eindkie vol boone gegeen en gesê, sê vir my, wat denk jy? En toe kom hy terug, toe sê, nee, hy denk as potentieel, maar ons moet nog baie verbeter. Um, ek denk hy het so half dag gegaan het op waar het vandaan kom meer as, maar die vriend wat my nou bekend gestel het, het ook half my gesê, met het nog altijd die gevoel gehad, dat as al kans is vir koffie in Zuid-Afrika om brood die hevers wees. So, uh, so het ons pad begin, hy het my toe bykie met verwerking gehelp, gehelp om die verwerking te verbeter, en ons het vir mekaar kwaliteitsdoelwit neergesit, so ons, ons doel was nie om um, een halse lot koffie te produseer, maar nie eindelijk iets te hee wat mense wil drink nie, op die ouwe en wil mys hee, sit Afrikaners moet kan trots wees op die koffie wat hulle drink, en ons al twee gloe, daar is ruimte vir Zuid Afrika om specialiteitskoffie te produseer. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the coffee and where it comes from and where it's roasted. So the coffee you're drinking now is called our All Day Blend. And I think one of the many lessons that I learned when I came to the farm is that there's the right tool for everything. And this is the right tool for all day. Sometimes you just want a good, easy drinking coffee that you can drink all day. This is it. So it consists of coffee from Tanzania, from the Kilimanjaro region, from Brazil, specifically from the Sao Paulo districts up north close to Minas Gerais on a farm there one of my friends owns um, and then it's got coffee from from here as well from us so the reason we blend it like Zander said earlier is to get that balance so we're really looking for that balance of the flavors so when you're tasting your coffee I first want you to have a good smell and that introduces you to the coffee it's kind of like the the handshake when you come someone you get a nice handshake and a good firm grip you kind of get to know what to expect and you're going to taste the coffee but you're going to do something that I'll, that my mum would be incredibly embarrassed if I did it in front of a bunch of ladies and I likely aspirate. The less technical term is schlur. So you want to really aspirate and get a nice spray over your mouth and that gives you the good full flavour profile. It also incorporates a bit of air. So the louder you do, the better it tastes. So that's the all day espresso and it's got those like like we said we're trying to just find a nice easy drinking balanced coffee that everyone can wake up have the coffee just before bed have another one <laughs> and the whole way in between as well so i think you were just asking me a bit about how coffee is processed so when coffee is uh is farmed we saw the the, the flowers after about eight eight to nine months you'll start to get the red cherries we pick the cherries unfortunately Coffee tends to be very uncooperative as a, as a crop. So you'll have some coffee that's still a flower, you have some that's green, some that's ripe, and some that's already overripe. So what we do is we hand pick each cherry. So we make sure that it's red and ripe. We check the bricks levels to make sure the sugar levels are correct. Once we've done that, we bring it back here and we remove that cherry through a little pulper. Then we dry it. And, oh, so depending on how we're going to process it, there's different ways to process it. The one way is uh, fermenting it. So we'll put it into water and let the enzymes just break down that sugar content on the outside. It's a sugar substance called mucilage. So we'll let the enzymes natural yeast to break that down. Or what we're busy do, experimenting with now is what if we don't do that? What we, if we leave that mucilage on the, the cherry, or, or sorry, on the seed, what happens then? And what we realize is that we get a lot of that sugary substance comes into the flavor and you get a nice sweet balanced coffee. 
if you get it wrong, it tastes like vinegar. So you've got to like work incredibly hard to get it right. Um, after that, we'll put it onto drying racks, so the drying racks outside, and we dry the coffee out until it reaches 11% moisture. And then there's another little papery substance around the outside called parchment. Oh, lovely. So this is the parchment. So this is dried, and on the outside is still this papery substance. So we get that removed, and inside, finally, after all that processing, you get the green cherry or the, the green seed and that's what we send for roasting so we have some good friends down in Pretoria who roast this for us and they roast it all all the components of the blend they'll roast individually um, to get the optimum flavor for that coffee and then we blend it so it's called a post roast blend as opposed to a lot of other places will pre-blend we do a post roast Stel bekend, die nieuwe, sterker as ooit tevore, 165 kW Hilux GR Sport. BKB, die betrouwbare tuiste van landbouw. BKB, the trusted home of agriculture. Ilanko, we are driven by our vision of food and companionship enriching life. <laughs> 